let's take a look at bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is the formal organizational arrangement characterized by division of labor, exercise of authority through a vertical hierarchy, and a system of internal rules and regulations. Bureaucracy often refers to the administrative branch of the government and individual agencies. We are less conscious of the role of bureaucracy under other, more routine circumstances. Much bureaucratic decision-making is obscure or just not directly meaningful to most of us. Some of the most important work of government agencies takes place away from public view, yet everyone has a general opinion, usually negative, about bureaucracy and about politics. Regardless of our level of awareness or frustration concerning bureaucratic activities or decisions, the institution of bureaucracy sparks strong emotion among millions of Americans. It's been suggested that the language of bureaucracy, its jargon, has harmed the English language. In one way or another, most of us are familiar with government bureaucracy. Mention of the bureaucracy usually evokes a strong response. Bureaucrats are unpopular with many of those that they serve. Bureaucracy has been blamed for many of society's current ills for several reasons. Government agencies are clearly influential, and in all but a handful of cases, bureaucrats are not elected by the public. They are convenient and increasingly visible targets who in most instances cannot be removed from office by popular vote. We hear a great deal about the growing power of bureaucracy and of bureaucrats. We hear of the arbitrary nature of many decisions, a lack of accountability, questionable ethics, poor service quality, impersonal treatment, wasteful spending, and simple cases of incompetence. On the other hand, when the natural and non-made disasters strike, citizens turn to government and its bureaucratic institutions for emergency relief and protection. Shifts in the public opinion also reflect variations in confidence and trust in the government, and they are generally associated with government's ability to deliver services, maintain economic growth, protect citizens, and resolve basic social issues. Expressions of trust or mistrust in government largely reflect feelings about the condition of the economy and the national administration. Bureaucracy often becomes a focal point of discontent. Because they are not subject to direct political controls, there's a perception that bureaucracies mismanage scarce resources and decisions are not transparent. Discretionary authority power is defined as the ability of individual administrators in a bureaucracy to make significant choices for programs they oversee. This authority is particularly evident in systems with separation of powers. Attitudes towards public and private bureaucracies have been affected by larger complex reactions towards corporations, governments, and other major institutions in American society, such as businesses, labor, and the media. Public confidence is often adversely affected when governmental activity directed towards dealing with these problems is perceived by the public to be ineffective. By contrast, support for selected federal agencies such as the U.S. Coast Guard and the Federal Reserve Board of Governors has improved dramatically. Fluctuation in public confidence, respect, and trust appear to be associated more closely with the strength or weaknesses of the national economy than the political party in power. Whether public attitudes towards government bureaucracy in general and bureaucrats in particular have followed broader opinion patterns exactly is unclear. However, the public's regard for public administrators has decreased in recent years. Variations in bureaucracy's public standing have coincided with greater demands for public services, the increasing complexity of the nation's problems, and much larger levels of competence and professionalism among government workers. Finally, perhaps the public has come to expect too much from government, sometimes encouraged by the mass media and public officials themselves and has made bureaucrats into scapegoats for not meeting public expectations. 
Whether bureaucrats are deserving of these harsh sediments is another matter. The more complex the problems, the greater the discretionary authority vested in bureaucrats to attempt to deal with them. Public administration may be defined as all processes, organizations, and individuals associated with carrying out laws and other rules issued by legislatures, executives, and the courts. This definition includes considerable administrative involvement in forming and implementing legislation and executive orders. Public administration is also a common field of academic study and professional training for government employees. This definition does not limit the participants in public administration to administrative personnel or even to people in government. Public administrators include a wide variety of individuals and groups with a common interest in government action. Among stakeholders, the foremost, perhaps, are the administrators themselves. Also included are members of the legislature, legislative committees, and their staffs, judges, political party officials whose partisan interests overlap extensively with issues of public policy, lobbyists seeking policies and actions from the government, private contractors who provide goods or services to a public agency, and media personnel. Even citizens can have some impact on the directions of public policies and of public administration. Public administration involves all stakeholders in shifting patterns of relationships in state, local, and national governments. The politics of administration involves agency interactions with those outside the formal structure, as well as interactions among those with administrative agencies. The terms public administration and public management are both concerned with implementing policies and programs enacted through authoritative institutions of government. Public management is a field of study central to public administration. It emphasizes internal operations of public agencies, such as planning, information systems, budgeting, personnel management, performance evaluation, and productivity improvement. Even though they may appear to be interchangeable terms, public management emphasizes methods of organizing for internal control and direction for maximum effectiveness. Public administration addresses a broader range of civic, electoral, and social concerns. Despite these differences, managerial skills and relevant experience are essential prerequisites to leading public agencies. Networking and organizing skills are the indispensable foundation on which actual operations are built and sustained. An important point for the public manager is that action is expected even if it's not necessarily advisable or convenient. There is a growing emphasis on individual character and leadership as opposed to simply managing established routine operations. There is also continuing interest in improving the quality and reliability of services provided in both public and private organizations. Unlike the traditional top-down bureaucratic chain of command, this conception envisions a reverse pyramid in which new managers are at the base supporting frontline employees responsive to the customer. Another concern is the prospect of transforming organizational structures given the many changes in information communication technology. Still other concerns for managers include the challenge of providing career development for employees and applying emergent customer service techniques to running large, complex, bureaucratic organizations. Public managerial responsibilities have become more complicated and, at the same time, beneficial to employees, citizens, and their organizations. The U.S. Constitution is mostly silent regarding public administration and management. The document only refers to Congress's legislative authorization and appropriation authority and the president's responsibility to faithfully execute the laws. The structures and procedures that exist today are products of congressional action. The national executive branch is organized primarily into five major types of agencies, 
four formal foundations of organization, and four broad categories of administrative employees. They affect both the way administrative entities function and the content of policies they help to enact. Sometimes referred to as simply departments, Cabinet-level executive departments are the most visible, though they're not necessarily the largest, national executive organizations. This is also true in most states and localities. There are 15 departments in the national executive branch. Examples include the Departments of State, Defense, Commerce, the Treasury, Justice, Labor, and the Interior. Each department is headed by a secretary and a series of top-level subordinates, all of whom are appointed by the president with approval of the Senate. Their main function is to provide policy leadership for their respective departments on behalf of the president, but in practice, they also speak to the president for their departments. Departments are composed of many similar administrative units with a variety of titles, such as Bureau, Office, Administration, and Service. Finally, departments and their subunits generally are responsible for carrying out specific operating programs enacted by Congress. They have fairly specific program jurisdiction as well as objectives. Jurisdiction in bureaucratic politics refers to the area of programmatic responsibility assigned to an agency by the legislature or chief executive. It's also used to describe the territory within the boundaries of a government agency or entity such as a local jurisdiction. Independent regulatory boards and commissions are a second major type of administrative organization and differ from cabinet level departments in a number of important ways. First, they oversee and regulate activities of various parts of the private economic sector. Second, they're headed by a board or commission of several individuals, usually five to nine, instead of a secretary. Third, they're designed to be somewhat independent of other institutions and political forces. Members of these entities are appointed by the president with Senate approval, but have more legal protection against dismissal by the president than cabinet members. They also normally serve a term of office longer than the appointing president. These entities are designed to regulate private sector enterprises in a detached and objective manner and are expected to prevent corruption. Some controversy has existed, however, over just how detached and objective these organizations have been in relation to those they regulate. Independent regulatory boards and commissions are not the only government entities having regulatory responsibilities. A phenomenon of considerable importance in the growth of government regulation since the 1960s through a variety of administrative instruments. These are the national, state, or local organizations that are identical to private corporations in most of their structures and operations except one, they're government owned. The EOP, or Executive Office of the President, is a collection of administrative bodies that are physically and organizationally housed close to the Oval Office and designed to work for the President. Several of these entities are especially important. First, the White House office consists of the president's key staff aides and staff directors. Second, the Office of Management and Budget, known as OMB, assists the president in assembling budget requests for the entire executive branch. Then, OMB forwards them to Capitol Hill as the president's annual budget message, coordinates operating and regulatory programs, and improves management processes throughout the executive branch. Third, the Council of Economic Advisors, or CEA, is the president's principal research arm for economic policy. It frequently influences the president's economic thinking. Fourth, entities such as the National Security Council were designed originally to generate a broad overview of policy directions. They consist of the president, vice president, key cabinet members, and other officials. 
The formal purpose of these entities is to monitor and assess administration policies. Finally, there are miscellaneous independent agencies or other independent executive agencies that have no bureaucratic departmental home but fit into no other category that we've discussed. The foundation of organization are function, geographic area, clientele, and work process. The most common organizational foundation is according to function, indicating that an agency is concerned with a fairly distinct policy area, but not limited to a particular geographic area. Organization according to geographic boundaries indicates that an agency's work is in a specific region. State and local governments are important for the same reasons. The administrative structure has an impact on the way government functions and on the content of policies it helps to implement. In general, states and larger local governments resemble the national government in composition of their executive branch agencies. Most states now have numerous cabinet level departments. States also have a wide variety of regulatory bodies, some government corporations, and miscellaneous agencies. Similarly, most governments have a fairly strong executive office staff responsible for their leadership. There are more than 88,000 governments within the United States, and except for the national and state governments, all are local governments such as cities, counties, townships, and school or special districts. Individual state and local agencies are similar and more numerous than their national government counterparts. Despite the relatively large number of governments, over 90% of all public agencies are comprised of fewer than 50 employees. There are also many more elected local officials than state and national ones. 96% of the over 513,000 elected officials serve on elected boards or commissions in states or local governments. These elected governments are small governmental units averaging about six elected representatives per jurisdiction. States and communities also vary in terms of climate, economies, geography, population size, type of government, and urbanization as well as the individual characteristics of the residents themselves. Some state agency structures reflect past or present influences of particular interest groups more than those in Washington do. Larger cities like New York, Chicago, Atlanta, and Los Angeles have bureaucratic arrangements not unlike those in state and national governments. There's a great deal of administrative specialization, a directly elected chief executive, a mayor, with a highly developed executive office staff and similar bases of organization. There are, however, some differences between local governments and state and national government. Local party politics frequently play a more predominant role in shaping municipal public policymaking and local public employee unions have a great deal of influence in many cities. Local government activity focuses more on providing essential services like water, sanitization, and police and fire protection than on broader policy concerns such as education, healthcare, welfare reform, and mass transit development. In smaller communities, as well as in many counties and townships, bureaucratic structures are not very numerous or sophisticated. This can sometimes mean that professional expertise is not as firmly established in local government as it is in most state governments and the national government. This lack of expertise is often reflected in the limited quantity and quality of programs enacted by many local governments, a pattern particularly visible in some rural county governments, many smaller towns and villages, and most special districts. The larger the unit of local government, the more likely its bureaucracy is to resemble state and national administrative agencies. The political system has affected American bureaucratic activities. Political processes and their impacts on public administrative institutions are complex to describe. 
Governmental processes and administrative values have helped to shape the conduct of public administration and the many facets of intergovernmental relationships. At first glance, questions of organizational structure may not appear to carry major political overtones. But formal organizational arrangements may reflect and promote some interests over others because it's the product of the decisions reached through the political process by a particular majority coalition. Those who organize and recognize an agency in a certain way obviously have reasons for doing so, one of which is usually promotion of their own policy interests. Another important dimension of administrative organization is the political setting in which agencies operate. At the same time, structural arrangements can have significant political implications for administrative agencies. Organizational form can signify a number of things. First, a particular organizational structure demonstrates commitment to one set of policy objectives instead of another. Second, a particular structure helps to order priorities by promoting some programs over others. Finally, a particular structure may provide greater access to influence for some interests and less for others. Structure and jurisdiction are indirectly related and any change in structure will inevitably result in some reallocation of program jurisdiction. There are clear winners and losers in this facet of politics as in all others. Organizational structures, jurisdiction, and access in different settings reflect the relative power of competing political forces. Governmental power and authority in America are, by design, highly fragmented. The framers of the Constitution feared nothing as much as excessive concentrations of power. Therefore, they did all they could to divide power among the different branches of the national government, and they gave each branch various means of checking the power of the other two. This horizontal division of power is called checks and balances. The division of power places bureaucracy in the United States in a very different position from the one it occupies in many other countries who have adopted parliamentary systems. Checks and balances are a governing principle that creates overlapping and interlocking functions among the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government. These include the president's power to veto an act of Congress, Congress's power to override a presidential veto by a two-thirds majority vote, and the Senate's power to confirm or reject presidential appointments to the executive and judicial positions, and the power of the courts to determine the constitutionality of the actions of the other branches. There is little question in parliamentary forms of government about how, by whom, and through what channels authority is exercised. In parliamentary governments, the chief executive and top-level ministries are themselves members of the legislature. Parliamentary government is practiced in most democratic nations, and the chief executive, the prime minister or premier, is usually the leader of the majority party in the legislature or the parliament. In this situation, bureaucratic responsiveness to the chief executive and to the legislature are one and the same thing. Because power is scattered, the making of public policy in the United States lacks centralization and produces a great deal of slack in the decision-making system. In the absence of tight legislative or executive control, there are many opportunities for lower-ranking executives to affect implementation of the law. Related statutory language is often broad or even vague. It follows that there are many power vacuums throughout the decision-making process. This is the basis of some conflict between members of the executive and the legislative branches. Interest groups and bureaucratic agencies compete for increments of power to determine policy areas of greatest concern for them. The policy-making process is also broken into many parts, and responsibility for each component is determined by a combination of factors. 
It's not uncommon for public administrators to become significant players in the political game and to take initiative and influence the long-term development of policies, especially in specific programs under their jurisdiction. Thus, bureaucracy in American government differs from traditional notions of bureaucracy. It functions in a system in which accountability is enforced through multiple channels as the result of fragmentation of higher political authority. Bureaucracy has traditionally been thought of in terms of implementing directives of other government institutions. The idea of bureaucratic neutrality is central to the way executive branch bureaucracies have been designed to function in Western governments for over a century. Bureaucratic neutrality is a central feature of bureaucracy. It carries out directives of other institutions of government in a politically neutral way, without acting as a political force in its own right. Bureaucratic behavior is assumed to follow the intent of the legislature in the form of legislative enactments and guidelines for implementation. Bureaucracy relies on the legislature for substantial policy direction and for financial and political support. The legislature, in turn, looks to the bureaucracy for faithful and competent administration of the law. Legislative intent describes the goals, purposes, and objectives of the legislative body. Bureaucracies are assumed to follow legislative intent in implementing the law. The legislature is expected to supervise the work of the bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is distinctly subordinate to the will and initiative of other parts of the government. Legislative oversight is the process by which the legislative body supervises the work of the bureaucracy in order to ensure its conformity with legislative intent. Bureaucratic behavior is assumed to be subject to direction by the chief executive of the government. In the United States, the chief executive and top-level executives are independent of the legislature. In fact, they're almost always prohibited from serving in the legislature at the same time they hold executive office. It was traditionally assumed that bureaucracy would be neutral, professional, competent structures staffed by specialists in both general administrative processes and in their respective specific policy areas. The notion of a competent bureaucracy responding in a politically neutral manner to the initiatives of executives and legislatures has had a powerful influence on administrative practice in this country. The social setting of public administration has both direct and indirect impacts and changes in the setting carry wide reaching implications. Several socio-demographic changes during the past 60 years have been of particular importance in shaping contemporary public administration. Social demographic shifts in the population and economies of various regions impact the delivery of public service. The most obvious changes are population growth and shifts in demographic makeup of the population itself. These demands are often directed at administrative personnel such as police officers, firefighters, teachers, and healthcare workers. Globalization of the international economy has permitted mass production and distribution of durable goods on a larger scale than ever before. Adapting new technologies and adopting to a global economy have become increasingly important to public administration. Rapidly emerging patterns of change in communication, medical, and transportation technologies has significant impacts on societal challenges confronting government. The knowledge revolution is another dimension of technological change and is giving rise to both the education industry and the expansion of privately and government-sponsored scientific research. Creating new technologies and vast new areas of research and education is a global social phenomenon of the past 40 years, particularly in Western industrial nations. The need for increased specialization is evident throughout much of the public and private administration. Technology has allowed for the creation of electronic communication networks that allow everyone anywhere to communicate and exchange data on the internet. 
The blog sphere is a portion of the World Wide Web consisting of web blogs or blogs and their interconnections. They create a community of amateur and professional journalists commenting on a variety of subjects. This reinforces the patterns of more informed decision making and results from easily accessible knowledge and less centrally directed decision making. The desire for specialization is a major reason for fragmenting and compartmentalizing decision making responsibility within a bureaucracy. Political decisions to address new problems or to identify problems already present have almost always enlarged the responsibilities of administrative bodies. Many of these changes are global in nature and impact governance in many different countries. Clearly, change in American society has led to a new, unforeseen, and complex pressure on government at all levels. Many similarities exist between administrative activities in the public and private sectors. In fact, many elements of public administration have their roots in the private sector. But the notion that there are important differences between public and private administration is undergoing some intense scrutiny. Although some parallels do exist, there's also critical differences among the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. In both settings, managers and those to whom they're accountable have an interest in running programs that are properly designed, appropriately directed to meeting their intended goals, efficient in expenditure and organizational resources, and effective in their results. Public and private managers are both concerned with meeting their staffing needs, motivating subordinates, obtaining funding, and conducting their operations to promote the survival and maximum impact of their programs. All of this involves some politics, both internal and external to the organization. There are agreements to be reached and maintained and gains and losses to be realized. On the other hand, important elements of the managerial environment differ for the public, nonprofit, and private manager. One fundamental difference is that in the private sector, products or services are purchased by individuals based on their own needs or wants. In the public sector, however, the goal of the manager historically has been to operate programs and provide services on a collective basis, supported in the great majority of cases by tax revenue. Another key difference is that private organizations define their markets and set their own broad goals, whereas public organizations and managers are obligated to pursue goals set for them by their legislatures. Public managers have relatively little freedom to alter basic organizational goals. While private managers can use an internal measure to evaluate their organization's performance, public managers are subject to evaluation by the public, who have the critical last word in judging how well public organizations fulfill its responsibility. Other differences also exist. Many public organizations have held a virtual monopoly on providing certain essential public services and consequently have been able to survive without providing the highest quality performance. Unlike private sector management, primarily concerned with profit, there are often conflicting incentives among citizens, elected representatives, and administrative supervisors and leaders. Without clear goals, an organization will not function as well. Most public organizations lack clear accountability for decisions made. Separations of power among branches of government is one factor and fragmented executive branch authority is in most large governments is another. In contrast, centralized executive responsibility is a key feature of many profit-oriented organizations. Also, unlike private corporations, public organizations entrust a fair amount of decision-making responsibility to citizen groups, courts, and various types of boards or commissions. A clear chain of command may not be possible because of numerous opportunities for outside pressures to influence the power hierarchy. There are still other important differences. Public sector managers frequently operate within structures designed by other groups in an environment where they're subject to scrutiny and criticism from the press. 
others outside the agency and the general public. There's also a growing tendency for governments to contract with private and nonprofit firms for services such as corrections, garbage collection, military security, social services, and fire protection. This has led to a greater interest in privatization as well as partnerships and direct delivery of services through faith-based and nonprofit agencies. Even these emerging realities do not change the fact that there are significant differences between public and private management. 